Street Freaks. Stay tuned after the show for a special promo from our friend Mo Blackwell at Targeted, True Crime Domestic Violence. It's a phenomenally well-researched production and one that I think you'll find extremely fascinating. Now, on with the show. Thank you for listening to Invisible Choir. This episode contains sensitive material, including graphic depictions of violence or abuse against children, which some listeners may find especially distressing or traumatic. Listener discretion is advised. No one ever wants to call 911 on a loved one. For most, it feels like a type of betrayal. We don't want to be responsible if that loved one is arrested or detained, afraid they might hold it against us forever. But what happens when you finally make that call, when you've appropriately responded to all of the warning signs of an impending mental health crisis, and then send the police away when they finally arrive at your front door? This time on Invisible Choir. Were you home when she did this, or did you just get home? I was asleep. You were asleep? Yeah. What? I told you that last night. You said you were fine. Why didn't you say something? My wife, my wife is dark here. Maybank, Texas, split between rural Henderson and Kaufman counties, about 55 miles southeast of Dallas in eastern Texas, with an estimated population of just over 3,000, it's what many in country music refer to as God's country. Its fertile soils, once home to widespread cotton farming, and with a beautiful historic downtown, Maybank is a type of place you feel comfortable raising a family. Its southern charm literally come to life. But in the late evening hours of Wednesday, November 1st, 2017, a man phones 911 from his trailer home in the Forgotten Acres subdivision to report that his wife's behavior is growing increasingly bizarre and that he needs help. The first call comes in at 11.29 p.m. EMS, this is Patricia. Hey, yes, ma'am. I was wondering if I could get somebody to come out here and check my wife out. Okay, what's the address of the emergency? In what city? Maybank, Texas. Okay, please repeat the address for verification. Fort Wayne Drive, Maybank, Texas. Okay, give me just one moment, please. Stop. Good enough. The man on the other end of the line is Jacob Henderson, husband to then 29-year-old Sarah Nicole Henderson. He can be heard quietly telling her to stop and that enough is enough in the background while he calmly requests EMS presence at the family's home. After patiently waiting for additional information, the call is suddenly cut off, so the dispatcher runs a reverse trace on the line and phones him back just a few moments later. Hello? Yes, sir, this is Trisha from EMS. We got disconnected. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, tell me exactly what's going on. Uh, my wife, she's like, I don't know, what, I don't know, something's going on with her. Okay. Can you describe what's going on, the symptoms? Like, she, like she's freaking out like somebody's out to get her. Okay, give us just one moment. Jake Henderson continues quietly arguing with his wife in the background. She can be heard quietly whispering that she is fine now, but she doesn't want the police or EMS at their home. If you won't listen to me, you won't talk to me. Sir, give me just one second. We're going to get help on the way. I'm going to add some information for him, okay? Okay, thank you. Don't hang up. Stay on the line with me, okay? Sir. I'm good. I'm good. No, you're not. Yes, I'm good. You're not good. Okay, are you with the patient now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how old is the patient? 20, 29. Is she awake? Okay, I promise. Yes, ma'am. Okay, is she breathing? Yes, ma'am. She's saying she's all right now. Is she violent? No, ma'am. She's saying she's fine now. Okay, we can still have them come out and check her out, okay? Uh, okay, does, uh, she, does she have a weapon? No, ma'am. Where is she right now? Right here in front of me. Is this a suicide attempt? No, ma'am. Is she thinking about committing suicide? No. Is she completely alert? Yeah, I'm just a different state of mind. Okay, is she responding appropriately? Sir? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sending the paramedics to help you now. Stand the line. I'll tell you exactly what to do next. If it's safe to do so, so observe her continuously. If it's safe to do so, protect her from herself. Okay. okay. Give me just a moment. Unsure of what may be contributing to her bizarre behavior, the 911 dispatcher gives Jacob Henderson instructions on how to protect her from herself and not to give her anything to eat or drink in the event she may have ingested some type of poisonous or other substance. After he agrees and prepares for EMS and police to arrive, the operator instructs him to wait by the front door and then terminates the call. But within the span of just a few minutes, he phones 911 again. This time, he wants his initial call disregarded entirely and wants to cancel any emergency response to the family's home. EMS, this is Anna, right? Oh, yes, ma'am. I talked to the lady in there while ago about sending someone out. Okay. Uh, I don't feel like I need a disregarder. Give me just a second, okay, to get that call pulled up. 
Uh, and you, are you the one that called it in originally? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And why would you like to cancel the call? She's fine now. And what was your name? Jake Henderson. Okay, so just let me verify. You want to cancel the ambulance at this time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, I'll let them know, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Though 911 cancels the responding ambulance, they still send two Henderson County Sheriff's deputies to respond to the family's home to see if they need further assistance. Both uniformed deputies arrived just minutes later at around 1145. When approached, both Jacob and Sarah Henderson explained that though she was agitated earlier in the evening, exhibiting signs of extreme paranoia and indirectly referencing suicide at times, they don't believe she represents a threat to herself or others. And after further discussion, the police didn't get the sense that she was experiencing any type of overt mental health crisis. They claimed everything was fine, and so it seemed. So the police, having no other choice, left. Things were relatively quiet for the next few hours in the Henderson home. Sarah's two younger children, both from previous relationships, fell fast asleep on the living room floor. Jacob Henderson checked on his two young stepchildren, seven-year-old Kaylee and five-year-old Kenley, one last time before retreating to the couple's bedroom, where he and Sarah went to sleep. His entire world would come violently crashing down just two and a half hours later, when he was abruptly woken by the sound of a loud clicking noise. It was his wife Sarah standing over him with a gun. She had it pointed tightly against his head, but it jammed when she pulled the trigger. The sound of the hammer coming down on a 38 caliber pistol instead, jolting him awake. He immediately grabbed for the gun and struggled to his feet, the next few moments quickly evolving from confusion to fear to profound grief once he made his way back out to the living room. Henderson County, 911. Yes. My, my wife. My, my wife is shot again. Okay, is this Jacob? Yes. Okay, what is your wife's name? She's trying to commit suicide now. She's trying to choke herself. Why do you keep grabbing your neck? What is her name, sir? Sarah Henderson. Sarah Henderson? Yes, sir. Okay. You can't what? All right, and how old are the children? Seven and five. And they're in the bedroom? Huh? Are they in the bedroom, sir? No, they're in the living room. They're in the living room and they're not breathing? No. Were you home when she did this or did you just get home? I was asleep. You were asleep? Yeah. Is she under the influence of any drugs or alcohol? No. As if awakening from a dream and into a terrible nightmarish reality, Jacob Henderson fights for control of the pistol, eventually getting it away from his wife, who repeatedly cries out, Oh my God, what have I done? Forgive me. And you have the weapon now, sir? Yes, ma'am, I got it. Okay. Are there any other weapons in the house? Yes. Okay. And does she have access to them, or are you keeping her from doing that? No. No, I don't. <sighs> okay, sir, we do have help on the way, okay? We have an, an ambulance headed that way, as well as officers, okay? Okay. Okay. Is there anything okay. else you need to... No. Okay. Police and EMS are dispatched back to the Henderson home at 2.24 a.m., this time to investigate a gruesome crime scene, a murderous plot that seems to have been mistakenly interrupted by the malfunctioning pistol. The couple who just hours before told police that everything was fine now struggles to make sense of what has happened. Jacob Henderson lost in despondent grief and weeping uncontrollably, while his wife Sarah, seeming to have snapped out of whatever trance she was in, struggles to process the gravity of her actions. Why did I do that, babe? I don't know. She's not trying to leave or anything, correct? Nothing's going on. Jacob struggles to get the words out clearly. He repeatedly tells Sarah that no one is coming to get her. She had been experiencing paranoid delusions earlier in the evening, claiming that someone was after her, that they were coming to get her. But it was all inside of her head, just a figment of her imagination or signs of a much deeper, more disturbing mental health crisis. And she hasn't been under the influence of any type of drugs or anything? No. What did I do, Lord? What did I do? What did I do, God? What did I do, God? They, they know what I was. Why? No, stop. Do what? Why? 
I'm gonna just keep you on the phone with me, okay? Okay. <laughs> what? 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 Get, get him. Okay. Get him. She's not, why? She's not trying to leave or anything, is she? No. Okay. Were the children asleep in the living room, or did they get up? You know? yeah, they, were, they were asleep. They were asleep in the living room, and then she went in there? Yeah. I was asleep. And were you asleep in the bedroom? Yes. Okay. Was uh, Sarah asleep in the bedroom with you when she got up? I guess. She was asleep when I went to sleep last night. And I woke up. She came in there. She was saying about the shot the kids. And I, I, I didn't want to believe it. I went in there. And then they were dead. Stop choking yourself. Quit. Sarah Henderson, unable to get the gun back from her husband, Jacob, continues trying to choke herself to death to commit suicide before police can arrive. After waking to her failed attempt at killing him, Jacob discovered seven-year-old Kaylee and five-year-old Kenley's lifeless bodies covered in blood in the living room, both children having been clearly shot in the head execution style as they slept, likely dreaming little dreams that children do while fast asleep, both of their lives over in an instant by their mother's own hand. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting out there as fast as we can, okay, Mr. Henderson? Please, okay. please, please, what? Please, 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 <laughs> and you have gone down there and kneeled against him and they're not breathing? Yes, yeah, it's okay. good right out of here. Okay, okay. <laughs> After it becomes clear that her attempts at self-choking are futile, she turns her attention back to Jacob and begs him to shoot her, to end her life before the police will arrive. Thank you. Thank you. I told you that last night. You said you were fine. Why didn't you say something? I'm just keeping you on the phone with me, okay, until the first responders get there. Okay. Okay. What? What, babe? What? What? No. Quit. What is she doing? She's trying to get the gun from me. Well, no, okay. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? Did you sit up and take this gun, too? Don't lie to me. What? I don't understand, Jake. I don't understand. I don't understand. what? What are you talking about? I don't understand at all. Woo! Jake! What? What? Sorry. Why, though? Why? 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 Wow. I can't stop, Jake. Can't stop what? I don't know. What, what did you, why'd you do it? You never went to sleep? What are you doing? Oh my God. What? What? What, babe? Nothing. Nothing. I'm lost. I'm lost, babe. Here we go. Here we go. I'm still here, Jacob, okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Looks like the officer's maybe pulling up right now. Do you see him outside? Jimmy. He's still here. Okay, well, I'll let you go now, okay? So you can open the door. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Twenty-nine-year-old Sarah Nicole Henderson was arrested and taken into custody early Thursday morning. The community of Maybank, Texas, awoke to the devastating news. Two innocent little girls had been murdered in cold blood as they slept, their mother presenting no clear motive, though upon their arrival, she immediately confessed to police. Seven-year-old Kaylee and five-year-old Kenley were beautiful and innocent. Their death makes no sense. You know, we don't have the answer to why. She's very matter-of-fact. Uh, 
She really didn't show any remorse, and um, you know, she, she told us that she had been planning it. Henderson County Sheriff Bodie Hillhouse describes Sarah Henderson as calm and matter-of-fact-like in her presentation once taken into custody at the Henderson County Jail. There, once advised of her Miranda rights, she began to talk, admitting to police that she had actually been planning the murders for over two weeks, and that she had also intended to kill Jacob while he slept and then herself, but that her plan was foiled once the gun jammed. With no obvious motive, they pressed on, and Henderson revealed that she was, quote, going crazy, and that she was just caught up in everyday life. She also explained that recent financial difficulties were bringing the family great stress. But police also looked to her close friends and family in the days after the killings for an explanation as to why. What would cause her to snap in the way she did? It wasn't long before they discovered that Henderson had likely been struggling with mental illness for some time, and that her behavior had alarmed others in the past, including her mother, and close neighbors. Henderson's mother is convinced that something happened to make her daughter snap. She said she loved those girls. And I asked the sheriff about that contrast between what you hear on the 911 tapes and what he describes now as her lack of remorse. He said that they are looking into Sarah Henderson's mental health history, talking to anyone who was close with her, but that it's their job to follow the evidence and the district attorney's job to decide what to do with it. Sarah Henderson's mother would also reveal that she had previously been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and that in the weeks before murdering her two daughters, she had been asking for help, believing that her mental state was rapidly deteriorating. She had also developed a stronger sense of paranoia, expressing the belief that people were out to get her, to attack or possibly abduct her from her home. But according to her mother, Sarah's actions didn't make any sense. Regardless of her diagnosis and recent mental health struggles, she believes something must have happened that caused her daughter to snap. But other family members describe Sarah's behavior as completely normal and, quote, perfect the week before when they had all gathered to attend a local football game. There were no warning signs that any of them had seen in the days preceding the murders. Jacob and Sarah Henderson's neighbors, however, kept their distance and described a routinely agitated and at times threatening mother. She yelled at him constantly. We could hear her yelling and cussing at the girls. Terrible language. You know, get your blah, blah, blah in here. I'm going to beat your... <laughs> yeah, she, that was mainly why I never really met her. She just wasn't my kind of person. It breaks your heart. I feel like saying, why didn't you just give them to us if you don't want these kids? You know, how does a mother do that? It's unthinkable. The little girls would come over here and ride their little bicycles around the circle, little training wheels on there, and they would uh, draw pictures and put them in the mailbox for us. I would have never imagined it would have been those kids. They're two beautiful little faces. They were such pretty little girls. You just don't. You don't find them like that all the time. They were adorable. Sarah Henderson was charged with two counts of capital murder of someone under the age of 10. Charges that if found guilty in the state of Texas carry a mandatory penalty of life in prison without the possibility of parole or death. She was also charged with one count of attempted murder for admitting her thwarted plans to kill her husband Jacob. Neighbors, friends, and family of little Kaylee and Kenley gathered at the Southside Elementary School on Friday night of that week in Maybank, the very school that both little girls attended, to honor and remember them and to reflect on their lost lives. In times of darkness, it's human nature to look for the light. There are flickers of it here at Southside Elementary in Maybank. Light in the prayers they lift for two young sisters, for seven-year-old Kaylee and five-year-old Kenley. But prayers cannot answer the question, why? <laughs> So they hug their children a little tighter tonight and collectively wrap arms around two young sisters. The two half-sisters were described as inseparable best friends. They both enjoyed riding bikes, swimming, dancing, and cheerleading. The Southside Elementary School Superintendent, Dr. Russell Marshall, issued a statement immediately following their murders to a community of grieving students, teachers, and parents. Today our hearts are breaking, as this morning we received news that two Southside students were killed in their home. Counselors are at Southside today to provide comfort for our students and employees. They will also be available to help in any way needed for parents. Please bathe the Southside campus with your thoughts and prayers during this trying time. Though many speculated early on that Jacob and Sarah Henderson might have been involved in some type of altercation that could have possibly triggered her behavior to spiral out of control, Jacob was quickly ruled out as any type of contributing element to the crime. There was simply no good explanation as to why this 29-year-old mother would have committed such a depraved and calculated double murder. But after the Texas Rangers, Child Protective Services, and the Henderson County District Attorney began their investigations, a darker history of Mother Sarah Henderson's alleged abuse and neglect was revealed after a report was released implicating her in the mistreatment of another one of her children one that, thankfully, was not in the home the evening she murdered Kaylee and Kenley. It turns out, Sarah Nicole Henderson had yet another child, an older son.
An unsealed Child Protective Services report dating back to 2010 and 11 revealed that Sarah Henderson and her then-boyfriend were not adequately caring for her other young son, putting him in a state of, quote, considerable or extreme vulnerability. CPS social workers eventually revealed that Sarah's then-boyfriend had also been sexually abusing her son, among other documented instances of abuse, including instances when the child consumed feces, and on one occasion when he allegedly ingested prescription medications, becoming extremely impaired and falling off of a truck, severely injuring himself in the process. Henderson's custody was revoked and the child went to live with his biological father. As a result of that investigation, Sarah Henderson was forced to undergo counseling and complete parenting classes. But that was it. There was nothing more. As she sat in county jail for her vicious crimes, Sarah Henderson also assaulted a correction staff, resulting in one additional charge of assault of a public servant. Could it be that this mother of three had exhibited all possible warning signs of someone who could potentially explode into a fatalistically violent rage and kill her own two daughters? In addition to the unsealed CPS reports detailing how she lost custody of her firstborn son, police disclosed records that they had been called to the Henderson home twice in the two years before the murders, but neither call was from any type of violent behavior. During one interaction, a neighbor called police, indicating that they heard an explosively loud argument unfolding in the Henderson's home. But when police arrived a short while later, they found it was just Sarah Henderson loudly arguing with someone on the telephone. Jacob Henderson was not even in the vicinity. On another occasion, the Hendersons called for police support after reporting they had seen a suspicious vehicle in the area, potentially observing their home. Though it was never made public if Sarah was the one who made the call and if she may have potentially been experiencing a bout of paranoia similar to the night before she murdered her two daughters. As her pending trial date approached, a judge scheduled a preliminary hearing, requesting a review of Sarah Henderson's mental competency, as the depths of her mental illness seemed to imply she may not actually be fit to stand trial at all. Henderson's attorney hired an expert to evaluate her mental fitness, and that expert eventually found her to be insane at the time of the killings, and therefore mentally unfit to stand trial for her actions. The judge then ordered two independent experts to simultaneously evaluate her competency, one finding that she was sane at the time of the murders and competent to stand trial, while the other rendered a finding of insanity, implying that she was mentally unfit to face trial. The courts faced a split decision, but after the prosecution filed a motion of intent to pursue the death penalty, Sarah Henderson voluntarily accepted a plea deal from District Attorney Mark Hall. And on July 17, 2019, she pleaded guilty to two charges of capital murder. Texas mother who confessed to killing her own children is going to spend the rest of her life in prison. No chance of parole here. 31-year-old Sarah Henderson of Maybank admitted that she shot and killed her five and seven-year-old daughters all the way back in November of 2017. At that time, she had told police she was, quote, going crazy. Her husband said that she had been acting paranoid. As part of this plea deal, Henderson cannot appeal her conviction or her sentence. The charges of attempted murder and assault of a public servant were subsequently dropped against Sarah Henderson as part of her plea agreement. Jacob Henderson filed for divorce from Sarah shortly after the murders, and both he and the girls' fathers were supportive and in agreement with the district attorney's plea deal, revealing that they would rather see Sarah spend the rest of her life in prison than face the prospect of the death penalty. But these types of cases are some of the worst, like nightmares come to life, when the motive is simply nowhere to be found, and mental illness so convolutes the decisions, actions, and intentions of those who inevitably turn to violence. In this case, a mother who reached out for help, realizing that she was quickly losing touch with reality, and a caring husband who unfortunately believed her when she said that everything was fine. targeted true crime domestic violence we tell stories of those who were targeted by domestic abuse and investigate cases of family violence using academic research to interpret the events as a college professor i think we need to stop making family violence a secret let's use our stories to help heal and provoke change season three features the case of josh osborne which is a story of abuse when he woke up she was abusing him when he went to sleep she was abusing him so his abuse was non-stop it didn't matter what he did yeah. it was non-stop but it is also a story of hope. Targeted. True crime. Domestic violence. Listen to us for free on all of your favorite podcatchers. Peace, my friends. Peace.